Hi class and welcome to this first screencast on our next unit of cells. So we're still sticking with Big Idea 2 and Big Idea 4 and we're building on the idea that <clears throat> all living systems need energy and they need matter from their environment. So in the first unit we looked at macromolecules and we looked at how organisms get these macromolecules and get these nutrients from the environment. And we also looked at how they interact for the greater good. Well now we're going to apply these same concepts to cells. How do cells get the energy and the matter from the environment? And how do subcellular components work together to have the whole cell function properly? And later we'll look at how cells uh, function with one another. <clears throat> so here's our unit overview of cells. We're first in this video going to look at cell size and how that's an important component or, or factor in exchange with the environment. We're going to look at structure and function, a huge theme of cell membranes especially um, in this video. And then in the next video we'll look at transport across the cell membrane. We'll look at internal membranes and internal organelles. And then later on we'll look at cell communication and how cells communicate with one another. So what are cells? Well, cells are the basic unit of life. That is what we consider to be alive, is a cell. You can be unicellular and be alive. Now what I want you to do for homework real quick, and this you should know from a few years ago, I want you to write down the hierarchy of life all the way from an atom all the way to a biosphere. So think about where cells fit in that whole hierarchy. You should have about mm, seven or eight things in that hierarchy. Okay, so enduring understanding that we're going to focus on throughout this whole year, and we've already looked at growth, reproduction, and maintenance of living systems require free energy and matter. And so now we're going to look at how does this exchange of matter with the environment occur at the cellular level. <clears throat> And this applies to all cells. Uh, we're going to look at specific types of cells later on, but just know that if it's a cell, it needs to exchange matter with the environment. So I told you cell size is an important factor in how well this exchange works. Um, so a cell size is going to affect its ability to obtain nutrients, okay, so take in nutrients, and it's also going to affect its ability to eliminate waste products. We cannot have waste products building up in our cells. So when we refer to cell size, what, we're what we are really referring to is the surface area to volume ratio. Now you might be going, what the heck is that? Is this math? Well, it kind of is, but it's not too hard. So surface area is simply the outside surface of that cell. So that's just simply length times width. So the unit might be something like, um, you know, nanometers squared or something. Volume is the actual internal size. So that's length times width times height. And so what you do is you take this to this ratio, and that's going to tell you how efficient that cell is at getting in nutrients and expelling waste. So let's take a look at a figure. This is hope now cells are not perfectly shaped, but let's assume that a cell is the size of a cube. What we would have to do to this surface area is multiply by the number of sides of that cube. So looking at this smallest cell, we have the surface area of 1 times 1, but we're going to multiply that by that by the number of sides, which is 6. So just like looking at a dice in a, on, a, on a game board, if you will. So the total surface area then would be 6, and the surface area to volume ratio would be 6 to 1, or simply 6. Now looking at the next biggest cube, we now have <clears throat> This whole side is 2, this whole side is 2. So that's 2 times 2, but then we multiply by the number of total sides, which is 6, and we get 24. Now volume, length times width times height, that's going to be 8. So surface area to volume ratio is 3. And using the same concepts, we can find the surface area to volume ratio of the largest cube, which is 2. Now we're going to do an activity in class on this because I know this is going to be hard to understand right now. But doing the math in class will make a lot more sense. So what we find is that the smallest cube has the largest ratio, doesn't it? And the largest cube has the smallest ratio. What this means is that as cells increase in volume, so as this internal space gets bigger, the relative surface area that is surrounding it is actually decreasing. It's getting smaller. And the demand for material resources actually goes up because there's more stuff inside that, that needs to be fed. And think about what's in the center of that cell. It's the nucleus. That's the genetic control center of the cell. 
And right there in the center is where all those nutrients are needed. It needs oxygen, it needs minerals, it needs nutrients, ATP. And it has to come from the environment. And it has to diffuse through that whole big cell. And that's going to be very, very hard to do when you have not a lot of surface area and too much volume. But looking at this nice small cell down here, there's not a lot of volume here, and relatively, there's a lot of surface area surrounding it. So it's not going to take as much time or energy for nutrients to diffuse through that small cell to get to that center nucleus. And again, the activity we'll do in class will make, make this uh, seem a lot easier for you. <clears throat> so. In a nutshell, smaller is better. The surface area of the plasma membrane must be large enough to adequately exchange materials with the environment. So smaller cells have this more favorable, this larger surface area to volume ratio for exchange of materials. Now what I want you to do in your homework, sort of your second assignment in your notes, is apply this concept of surface area to volume ratio to the structure of the human lung. What do I mean by that? So try to write that down in your notes. Okay, now let's take a closer look at the cell membrane. So we've looked at cell size and how a cell membrane has to be big enough and have enough surface area to adequately exchange material. Now let's focus in on what is this cell membrane, how does it function, and what does it look like? Okay, well the first thing to understand is that it helps the cell maintain an internal environment. It encloses it, doesn't it? It helps the cell maintain homeostasis. That internal environment is certainly different from the external environment. And recall from our unit on macromolecules, we already know what the cell membrane is made of. It's made of a phospholipid bilayer. So remember that we have the hydrophilic polar phosphate heads and inside we have our hydrophobic fatty acid tails. So consider this would be the outside of the environment. This would be the inside of the cell. Um, these polar hydrophilic heads are going to face the aqueous environment, which just simply means water-based. And the hydrophobic tails face inside, they face each other. Now what's a new concept to us is that this cell membrane is what we call selectively permeable. It's only going to allow certain molecules to pass directly through without any help from proteins. So it's selectively permeable. That's very, very important for maintaining that boundary and maintaining that internal environment. Let's take a closer look at the membrane structure. We call the membrane structure the fluid mosaic model. Um, it's fluid because of this phospholipid. The phospholipids, right, are able to move, so they're fluid. And it's mosaic because there's some other stuff in there. It's a mosaic sort of a membrane. We've got embedded proteins, embedded cholesterol. We've got glycoproteins and glycolipids on the surface. And so what the proteins do is they're going to be sort of transport channels. And we'll take a closer look at them in the next video. They can be hydrophilic with charged and polar side groups. Remember the functional groups that we looked at in the first unit? This is what we're referring to here. Those are groups to the amino acids. Remember those. Or these proteins could be, could be hydrophobic with nonpolar R side groups. The cholesterol, remember that's an important liquid we learned about last video. These are really important in maintaining fluidity. And I'll show you a picture of that in a second. And then on the surface we have these glycoproteins and glycolipids, which are really important in cell-to-cell -cell recognition and communication. And the prefix glyco simply means carbohydrate. So it's basically a protein with a carbohydrate attached or a lipid with a carbohydrate attached. So the fluid mosaic model of the cell membrane. Um, <clears throat> and obviously we should consider how these different uh, functional groups and side groups are going to impact protein function. And we'll take a look at that in class. So I love this picture. So here is our fluid mosaic model, our phospholipid bilayer. Remember, it's selectively permeable. We have our polar phosphate heads, our fatty acid tails facing the inside. We have our embedded proteins. And these embedded proteins have lots of different functions. They can be enzymes. They can be communicators. They can be transport channels. Here's a glycoprotein, which would be important in cell-to-cell -cell communication. And then here, remember I said about cholesterol. So what cholesterol does is it gets embedded in there, and it helps maintain fluidity. So it opens up space so that the fatty acid tails can go back and forth like this. If we don't have a lot of cholesterol, they're going to be packed tightly together. The more cholesterol in there we have, the more fluid it is. And then here we have the inside of the cell. Um, <clears throat> And these are, this is just simply the cytoskeleton. So this would be the fluid mosaic model. 
Okay, selectively, per, selective permeability. So I'm gonna tell you some things that can pass through and some things that can't pass through. And then I want you to write down in your notes your hypothesis as to why that is so. So I will tell you, small uncharged polar molecules and small nonpolar molecules such as nitrogen gas can freely pass through the membrane. You tell me why. Hydrophilic substances such as large polar molecules and ions move across the membrane but they need embedded channel and transport proteins, okay? So they need these guys here in order to pass through. Again, you tell me why that is so. And lastly, water. Water can cross the membrane, but it has to ha go through channel proteins that are called aquaporins. And again, you tell me why they need aquaporins. Okay, some cells, in addition to a cell membrane, also have another boundary of a cell wall. This provides structure as well as a permeability barrier for some sub substances to move uh, across into the internal environment. Plant cell walls are made up of cellulose. Remember that carbohydrate polysaccharide we learned about in the first unit? They're external to the cell membrane, so plants have both a cell wall and a cell membrane. And then some prokaryotes and fungi also have cell walls made up of slightly different material. So here's a prokaryotic cell wall. Um, so the plasma membrane's in green and the cell wall is in yellow. And then here, plant cell in green with the cell wall. So here are your questions to answer in your video notes and I will collect all of your uh, video notes, including the embedded questions I asked you throughout, along with these end of chapter questions.